welcome everybody. Uh, just for our it is for attendance, for anybody that's in any of my classes. Um, it's for production management and for all the other classes. So just make sure to scan that and um, check what class you're, you're, you're in, or which class you're getting extra credit for, if you're getting extra credit. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Thanks to my production management class for uh, welcoming everybody, everybody that's not in this class as well. A uh, couple of housekeeping things real quick. Uh, so we are, for those of you that are not in the entertainment, um, any of my class doesn't haven't heard yet, we're doing an entertainment festival on November 9th. And uh, our students here, production management students, are going to put it on. And they've all received their roles this week. Uh, we have our festival directors and directors of food and beverage, director of sponsorships, and director of operations. So I'm really excited to get this journey started and to inspire you all for putting this event on. I brought a guest speaker uh, to, to help inspire and motivate everybody and offer some, some words of wisdom. But before we get there, we're going to have a director's meeting after this. So I know we won't have class today, right? Uh, traditional class. So after this, we'll have a director's meeting in room 222. Uh, everyone's welcome. Uh, we may not start like right at 12, like maybe 12.15, depending how, how long we, we take after, after um, Kevin. Kevin Cross, my, my buddy Kevin, I know it's Kevin, however <laughs> long the presentation takes. Um, and everybody can come to meet and talk to them. But um, any other housekeeping things? I think that is it. So, all right, so think Entertainment Festival, but I think this event that we're putting on, and it's the first year, pioneers are the first ones Putting this event on. I mean, technically the second ones, but it's the first time we're doing it within a course. And everyone in the course has a different role, which makes this class very, very unique. And I know last week I showed the South by Southwest uh, history to inspire everyone and to continue the inspiration to hit the ground running starting today. Now that everybody has their roles, who better to come talk to you about creating a larger than life event that than someone that has been part of larger than life events, right? And have been part of some of the biggest stages in the world and wrestling in. Saudi Arabia in front of thousands of people at an event called Crown Jewel and so many other accolades. So I'm excited to introduce you all to my buddy, Carrie Ann Cross, uh, also known as Kevin. Hello. That guy on the screen had a lot more coffee than I did today, so I promise I'm not gonna hit anybody with a chair over the head today, I promise, you are safe. Um, I wanna just let you guys know right off the bat the reason I am here today, um, personally is because everything I do um, in my life, I, I believe in the karmic wheel. I think it's imperative for us to find ways to give back and arm each other with the tools to find success. And I don't just mean monetarily, I mean finding something in this life that is actually personally fulfilling to do. And some of us, you know, on this journey, we will be fortunate to find that fulfillment in our work, and that's what I'm hoping to kind of help you guys find today. Um, everyone here looks relatively young. Um, it's quite a challenge to find that thing in life that you are absolutely certain that you want to be doing for the rest of it. And it's okay to do something for a short period of time or an intermediate amount of time that you enjoy and then decide to do something else. Um, so like you can watch that video, or like if you're a sports entertainment or a wrestling fan, you may be familiar with my work and you have a general idea of what I do and I'm in the entertainment industry, blah, blah, blah. I kind of want to tell you guys to preface like right off the bat to give you an idea of like who's actually speaking today, um, what I was involved with before wrestling. So when I was very, very young, I was living up in Canada. I happened to be walking by a bar around last call. I had my headphones on and a guy got thrown out and I was like a bit of a goth metalhead kid that was always wearing black and band t-shirts and stuff. This guy gets thrown out of the bar and I'm passing by the front door and he's hammered. He's completely drunk, bumps into me. I take my headphone out, I'm startled and he begins telling me how he shouldn't be kicked out of the nightclub, the bar, He's not drunk, he clearly is. He thinks I'm one of the bouncers on the front door wearing all black. That's how blasted this guy is. <laughs> He's completely blasted. So to be a gentleman and be polite, I kind of let him finish his deal, this whole story about how you know he needs to go back inside, and I politely let him know that I don't work there. So the front doorman blew up laughing. Once we kind of dissolved the situation, they asked me if I wanted a job. 
And at the time, I really didn't. But I was so scared of this man who was like this tall. He had tattoos all over his face. I kind of didn't want to say no. He was very intimidated. And that's kind of how I got involved with the entertainment industry. I became a bouncer. Um, I was in nightclubs and events prior to WWE for like 17 years. I started as a bouncer inside the nightclub. Then I was a doorman. Then I got into kind of like event planning with the promoters. Then I started doing festivals. Uh, at one point, uh, I was a director of nightlife security for the city of Las Vegas. Uh, if you guys haven't been, they have nightclubs inside the hotels um, along the strip. Uh, so I was hiring, training people. Got a big background in entertainment just aside from this, uh, especially you know when we were bodyguarding, I got into like executive protection stuff for celebrities, people in the gas and oil industry, you name it. Um, I kind of been involved with entertainment and event planning actually uh, for a really, really long time. And I started from the ground level. I wasn't just like an entertainer. I was someone who was on ground level and I've kind of seen this stuff play out every single weekend, probably since I was 18 or 19 years old. So I just wanted you to understand where I'm coming from. I'm, yeah, I'm coming in here as you know a performer for WWE, but I started from the very bottom. And I, you know, I understand how things play out and what people want to see and what people want to do with event planning and stuff like that. So you guys are here and you're learning how to do all of this stuff. I just want to see a, a show of hands if you're comfortable, how many people feel like like this has been the right course for them and this is what they want to do? Solid. Something that we all have in common here, myself with all of you, and I don't know if you guys look at it this way, but we all want to create something. And I always think back to like when I was a little kid, my favorite class, I don't know about you guys, was always arts and crafts. Because when you're in school and you're in elementary school, you kind of put on this road, you kind of put on this course where they give you information on the blackboard and they tell you to retain it and they tell you this is how it is. But then you got this one class that you go to and you can kind of just do whatever you want and it's okay. And I think that we all kind of find our own personal confidence in art classes. I mean, although this is like event planning and stuff like that, I still think that this is a form of creation. I do think that creating events and planning them is a form of art. And I kind of wanted you guys to embrace that concept if you already haven't before today. You guys are entering into a field where I do believe you can find a sense of personal fulfillment in the work aside from just being paid and the event going well. So like when I would when I would train teams of people for, let's say, security, specifically Las Vegas, I wasn't necessarily looking for the biggest guys. I wasn't looking for the toughest guys or the guys that were just going to annihilate the room if a fight happens. I wasn't looking for that. I would always try to explain to these people that were coming in. I'd, I'd read them and I'd feel them out. And I would suggest that when you guys have your own staff, please do the same help people understand when they're involved with putting an event together where people are supposed to have a good time, that you're making sure that they're having a good time. Even if you're doing like a corporate event that may feel sanitized or sterilized in a way, it's not necessarily, let's say like a, an EDC or something that feels like an artful event, you'd be surprised if people are coming in and let's say it's a corporate event, and you have just the few things that you think that they might need, you'll get that job back. The people that pay you, that ask you to put this stuff together, they'll call you, and this will kind of be like a, a reoccurring type thing. You secure your income. What are those types of things? It sounds silly, but just making sure that there might be a little bit of food there that everybody likes, Something in the modern era, everybody has a gluten allergy, having gluten-free options. My wife is, uh, you know, she can't have gluten, it's an allergy. You'd be shocked when we go to events, corporate stuff, the difference it makes in a room of 
people when you have something simple there for them where they can just kind of munch on that for a short period of time. Um, show of hands, how many people are more interested in doing events like perhaps, let's say, I'm just throwing it out there, EDC. And how, how many people are interested in doing corporate events? Cool. Would you mind if I asked you a question? I saw you put your hand up. What's appealing to you about doing a corporate event? Not a loaded question, I'm, genu I'm genuinely interested. I feel like it's calm. Say calm that. Calm compared to EDC. Say? It's calmer yep. compared to EDC. Sure, calmer compared to EDC, a little bit more organized, mm -hmm. less to worry about, love it. Uh, for the EDC, let me see the hands one more time. That type of event. Tell me what is appealing to you about organizing an event like that. Um, I love the energy of everybody around me. Everybody involved is like we're working as a team. Um, the excitement of everything going on around me is a lot of Cool. And that's, so two very different answers between both people, but both of them I guarantee you whether they, whether it's more apparent to one person or the other, they both want to make sure that people enjoy the process, whether it's corporate or it's more art related. You know, I think if you're if you're moving into this type of field, I think you will find the most success and the most fulfillment if you can if you can know once this thing is said and done that people had what they needed and they enjoyed the process as much as you're responsible for the process that they can enjoy, your goals are set. And I want to warn you, if people go to your event and they did not have a good time, even if it was not entirely your fault, you will not feel good about what you're doing. And if that's a reoccurring type thing where you're hosting or planning events and you're doing all that, and people are not enjoying themselves, you're going to want to split. It's going to feel like another job. And what I've personally found, uh, especially with the events and nightclub stuff prior to wrestling. You know, I wound up I wound up leaving and moving on to something else because there wasn't enough of me involved in the work. And it's something I wanted to kind of discuss with you guys today as a heads up. Do not feel intimidated or feel like it's a bad idea to commit more of yourself into event planning. Please trust me on this. Like the more involved you actually are, more accountability and responsibility that you can take on before it makes your head explode and stresses you out, the better you're gonna feel about your work. You could be a person that sets up a company of event planning rather than being maybe perhaps someone who gets hired on you know, contract work and stuff like that. You could wind up running your own company or an entrepreneur, you run this type of thing based on good experiences that you create for people. Like as, you know, be honest, uh, uh, event planning, putting events and stuff like that together, it's not the first thing that maybe comes to mind of like a young kid or a teenager who wants to grow up and do something extraordinary. Everything is romanticized on TV when you're little, you just want to do a job that you saw somebody do on TV or maybe you want to be an astronaut or something like that. But that doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't put event planning um, below any of that. It's about what you get out of your work. You know, approaching, your life path with that type of philosophy, I promise you will bring you fulfillment. I didn't do that for like 17 years. I didn't do it. Um, I made it about just getting the job done and making sure people were safe. It, it, it didn't occur to me until maybe the middle of the road or later that what I was doing was I was providing a service for people to make sure that they had a good time within what I was responsible for. I just wanted to convey that to you guys as just a train of thought. You will get Everything out of any job or any type of work you apply yourself to, the more you're invested. And that will be challenging because there will be some people that will feel like you're stepping on toes or you don't need to do as much as you're doing. If you feel like you need to do it, fight for it. Because it will be what makes you want to continue doing this for the rest of your life. Um, I am totally wide open to answering any questions about event planning, about security, about sports entertainment, um, 
any questions you guys have, I'm here as long as you need me. Any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. So in my early 20s, what looked more appealing to me when I was just staff was being in management. And I felt like there was this ceiling over my head for years. It was like this top secret thing no one was talking about, <laughs> like how to advance. Like what is going on? I would talk to my superiors about advancing. It was kind of like getting stonewalled. I wasn't really getting much feedback. And I was just like, what's going on here? I was like, Start to think to myself, am I being blocked? Are they afraid of me moving up? Are they afraid of my job? I really, you know, it was a very, very frustrating period. That's something like we're probably all going to go through, or you've already been through it and you're laughing to yourself privately. Um, what wound up happening, ironically, and this is the honest to God truth, when I was a doorman, I'm the first person that people would see coming into the nightclub or the event making sure that the people coming in feel good with you as their first point of contact. It sets the tone of everything inside. You never know who you're talking to. I wound up meeting famous people. I wound up meeting people that weren't famous but had a lot of money and were involved in other events and other coordinating stuff. Like, give me an example. There was someone who was running uh, executive protection bodyguard teams that had a night off and he came in and just because of the way I had dealt with this person at the front door, I was courteous. You know, you always had to check everybody's IDs even when they were 40 years old. That can be, you know, some people are very touchy about that. Like, oh, what do you mean? I, I don't, do I look like I'm 18? Like it becomes like this confrontation that's unnecessary. You have to learn how to shut that down and get somebody to relax. The way I dealt with them, on their way out, the guy came and he said, hey, listen, I've been going to nightclubs and events for three decades. I've never had someone have a human conversation with me. Like, they're always talking to me like I'm the patron and I may have already done something wrong before I've even gotten inside the, the club. And then here's the tough guy at the door. I was never like that with people. And just from having a human connection like that, I got his business card. And then I transferred over it to his events and he was like much more relaxed and the sort of environment that he set was based on if your work ethic is good and he feels like you could handle more, he was gonna promote you. And I had to come to find that I, at the time, was just not in the right place for me. It wasn't the wrong place, but for what I wanted to do, like where I was setting my career path, my goals, you know, I had hit the ceiling there. And I never figured out, you know, what the deal was, but ultimately just from being a good person in general, I know that sounds like a pipe dream to some people, but honestly, that's, that's pretty much how it happened. Just being good to people, you know? Uh, in work environments, when it, when it takes up so much of our time, whether it's 30 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours a week, we're seeing the same people all the time. You wanna be around people that are cool. You don't wanna be around people that you can just feel like don't wanna be there and their energy sucks. I don't know how to put it. Like, you have to spend so much time around the same people all the time. I just kind of got inspired by what I wanted to see in people that I wasn't seeing and I wanted to bring the room together. I wanted to be someone that people actually wanted to see at work. And I didn't put on a face and I didn't fake it, but I just thought like, what energy would I like to see in the room? I'm gonna bring that without overwhelming people. And that's kind of how things change for me. Absolutely. Anybody have a question? Yes. So on the tail end of high school, I got really, really interested in neurology. I, in high school, was absolutely positive I was gonna be a wrestler, but I was kind of just, to be totally honest with you, I was cruising and just doing the bare minimum to get by. I thought I was gonna go straight to a wrestling school and become a wrestler. That did not happen. I kind of like self-sabotaged myself by accident. I missed out on a lot of opportunities. But I did get, I, I got interested in neurology and at the time I was in Toronto, Canada and there was a university up there called York. 
So it just happened from reading a, a recreational paper that was in Yahoo News. I got really into it, and then I started to research. Like, oh, I um, was almost able to find out more about myself. It was kind of almost like self-work I was doing through neurology, which I think secretly is something that we all like to do with psychology and sociology. We read those papers, and even though we're reading about other people, we're actually sometimes, some of our own personality traits align with the case studies that are being released. So I kind of really got into that. Tried to apply to York. My marks in relation to other people's were abysmal. And I was like, damn, there's, you know, I got the letter, got turned down. They encouraged me to take on some college courses. So I took on some courses um, from, uh, they were like uh, courses that were being sponsored by Waterloo and a doctor named uh, Barbara Lando. I started taking courses in family mediation and corporate mediation. And so that comprised of psychology, sociology, uh, identifying power imbalances in couples, child development, substance abuse, um, and then kind of understanding and screening for the differences in personality and behavioral pattern disorders. Um, but my work got so good in the entertainment industry Money was coming in and I didn't want to turn down the work. I didn't follow up with it. But uh, I did take the courses and completed them. And in another life, you know, I probably would have done things a little bit differently and pursued neurology, but I have no regrets. I'm in a very good place right now. So studying that stuff actually, I found that it helped me identify a lot of different things around me socially and professionally and stuff within myself. So it did serve a purpose. Yes. How was the transition between doing event management into wrestling? Was it something you were doing balancing at the same time? Or did you meet a contact and did you start booking independence? How did that work? So around 25, 26, I was doing all of that stuff. I was in Las Vegas and I hit a wall with my work where I felt like a zombie coming in. Everything felt really monotonous. I felt really disconnected from my work and I started thinking to myself like, okay, I have this money in front of me and I have this career path in front of me and I can do this for the rest of my life. But, you know, for about a month, I thought maybe I was just in a bad mood, I was gonna kick out of it. And six months go by and it's like, oh no, I actually really, I really need to do something else because I, I couldn't get more out of what I was doing for myself, for my own personal fulfillment, you know? Financially, I became secure, which is something we're all chasing from the working class. We're all trying to get ahead so we don't have to be in debt and we don't have to constantly look at our banking app on our phone wondering if we can buy the coffee. You know what I mean? Like, that's where I was coming from. And I thought to myself, before it's too late, I need to go to this wrestling school that was just down the block from where I was working. And I, I just thought to myself, what did I always want to be when I was a kid? What did I always want to do when I grew up? It was to become a wrestler on TV. So I did both. I went to a wrestling school and um, I did uh, event management and bodyguarding at the same time. And luckily, because I had good relations with the people that I worked for, they afforded me the time off between doing the little independent events like you were mentioning and going to school and I was able to manage things. And I put together a really good team. Like I took care of these people and mentored these people and without fear, without judgment, without ego, thinking that they're gonna take over my job. Was, just never about that. I just knew that if I helped these people get to where they needed to be to be comfortable, and I built a team based off of loyalty and like a good connection, everything was gonna be okay. And it worked out that way. Because again, I, I really do believe innately, we're all just trying to be together in harmony and work together to succeed together. It doesn't have to be that one guy succeeds and everybody's eating out of his hand. I had seen models like that before with event planning, it doesn't work. The events suck, they fall apart, even with security. That sucks too. You're not sharing tips with the guys, you're making all the money at the front door, they figure it out. Now bad things start happening inside the nightclub and the bar. You don't want that, you become responsible for that. So kind of around the same time I was afforded um, that privilege to be able to take a little bit of time off and do it together. And it was really hard. <laughs> it was really hard. I didn't sleep much. So don't recommend it, but I did it so I can't be a hypocrite. The 
last one I went to was Rockville. I got to see Pantera for the first time. It's a band, uh, a band I grew up with. I probably put on 20 or 30 pounds of muscle over 20 years listening to them in the gym. I felt <laughs> like I, I like that was my band. You know, I'd exercise listening to that music. Uh, travel on the road. I would drive. You know, with wrestling, uh, when you're driving city to city, those drives can be very lonely. Sometimes all I had was Pantera with me in the car. So getting to see them live was awesome. The staff at Rockville was very charming, very warm. They had a lost and found, which I think is absolutely essential if you're doing some sort of arts planning event. Stuff falls out of people's pockets all the time. I lost a couple things. One of them I did not retrieve, which was my wedding ring. Yeah, that killed me. That killed me. Um, my, I did, uh, my wife got me a replica ring and we plan to get married again. This time we're gonna do something super ridiculous to, to take the tension off the fact that I lost the ring in the mosh pit. <laughs> I am an idiot. Should have took it off. Um, but yeah, uh, Rockville here in Florida was was solid. Um, they had food, they had free water as well. Just throwing these things out there for you guys to think about, you know, with the heat wave and stuff like that, that was a really good thing that they that they put in there. They were offering everyone free cold water. Super smart. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, who was your favorite wrestler growing up? And uh, nowadays, to what extent do you have control or, or some say in the creative aspect? I mean, your name, the entrance music, you're with the associate or whatever, um, whether you're a heel, when you turn. Yeah, so that sort of creative input. So I had many favorite wrestlers growing up. Uh, I was a kid who was kind of pre-programmed from a very young age to love wrestling. Um, I grew up in New York, um, and this was a time when New York was still very crazy. I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie Escape from New York, it's very old, but um, the movie was basically shot at night, and the, the theme of the movie was that New York was kind of like a giant prison, <laughs> overrun by like civilians who lost their minds, and that's what New York was really like after 10 p.m. for a really long time. <laughs> It was, it was super dangerous. Um, so being a kid, knowing that, uh, it, was, it was a little creepy. There's always people running everywhere at night. But no one was ever walking outside. They were always running. I was like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> it was very weird. But uh, my, my like uh, relief from that, I found wrestling on TV one day. That's the short version of that story. Um, and I just saw like this spectacle, like it was like, you know, from what my understanding was of the Coliseum, there's two guys in the ring, there's your referee, and it's a whole building, an event. Everyone in the whole building, all of their attention and energy is in one direction, it's right towards the ring. And as the guys are moving in the ring and they're performing, the energy's rising and the crowd's reacting with it, there's just this synergy between the people performing. And I was mesmerized as a kid. So mesmerized that like at that time, from like three or four years old, I made the decision to do this. And usually the decisions you make at three or four years old that don't last, and you're probably wrong about them. But this one thing that I was absolutely positive that I was going to do, and I tried not to do it for a long time, um, I just fell in love with it. So watching from you know that age, I had a lot of favorite wrestlers. I think once I had a grasp of what I was watching on TV, these people telling the oldest story in the world, which is basically light versus dark, if you really get down to the nitty gritty of it. Uh, Triple H, which is actually the guy I work for now, is probably my favorite wrestler. And we're not supposed to say that because we work for him and we think that, you know, we're trying to kiss his ass, but it is the truth. He was my favorite for the longest time, for the most consistent amount of time. Um, in terms of how how much I'm involved with this, quite a bit. Uh, each company has their own different structure, each wrestling company. I have come to find that the companies that host the events, that grant the most creative freedom to the performers, the audience has a better time at those events. Like if there's one particular person that's over dictating the creative process for the performers, it actually removes the performer out of 
what they're doing. And subconsciously, when the audience is watching, it feels there's like not something connecting. Um, so luckily, I'm working for a company where I have a lot of flexibility where I can do that. So super fortunate. I've worked for other companies where it's not that way. And I still enjoy my work, but I didn't enjoy it as much uh, as opposed to you know, the formula that we use here. Questions about anything? Yep. So glad you asked me that. <laughs> I'm not uh, I'm trying to think of the most honest way I can put this. So even though I'm, I'm a performer, I'm not extroverted at all. And I come to find that a lot of performers are like that. And even people who want to plan events are not necessarily extroverts. But internally, we, we do want to make sure people are having a good time. Like you can be an introvert and still want to host. You might not just want to, you know, some people have no problem overextending themselves. And we'll see that as introverts, that people sometimes who have no problem overextending themselves as extroverts, they sometimes, from our perspective, are able to attain more being out there. Um, it's just something that we have to learn how to balance. But with psychology, sociology, learning all that stuff, even child development, I found that I learned more about myself, which actually made me be able to relate more to people that I didn't know. And the way I would read a novel, for instance, or watch a film after I studied those courses and I was able to retain the information and really understand it at its core, made me look at everything completely differently. Like I honestly do believe, even for what you guys are doing, the more you understand about yourself, the more you'll understand about people and the human condition, the better your events are gonna be. And I have found that to be that way with wrestling as well. To give you an example, in a narration of our show, you can create larger than life characters, um, but if they're too far away from Earth, meaning like what we know, and people can't relate or get behind the motive of the hero or the villain, people will kind of just watch entertainment analytically, meaning that it's not the type of thing that takes them on that ride. A really basic example would be like, a, if you're watching a film and like a kid gets kidnapped and the mother or the father is attempting to rescue the kid, even if you don't have kids, you're gonna get behind that person who's trying to get the kid back. Um, if you watch a movie, a totally different type of movie where a guy's home world, he's like an alien, not Superman, I'm a big Superman fan, but uh, some guy's home world gets blown up and he's chasing the guy who blew up his home world and they have some sort of fight where they're flying in the air. It is entertaining to watch. I watch those films. But it doesn't take you on the same ride that feels more human, something that you could easily relate to. Um, and I more or less discovered that through taking those courses, just human relation. Um, it made me think about how, you know, I've been very lucky to travel all over the world. I, I've, even prior to WWE, I loved going to new places and learning about the cultures. It's something that my wife and I did together. We went to Thailand a few years ago and we bought this travel book. She would remember the name of it. I'm the one who gets slammed on the floor, so my memory's not that great. Um, but she bought this book, learning about the local cultures, um, how to say hello, um, what's culturally appropriate there when you're going there so you don't accidentally offend somebody or piss them off. Um, just learning how to say hello and thank you in another language, is there like, that goes a long way when you're going somewhere else. Um, having those experiences and going somewhere else it really does make you, it makes you realize that like, no matter how different the other person is from you, there are common grounds that you can find. Whatever they believe in, wherever they're from, you can find a common ground with anybody 
And I learned that just from, from traveling and, and studying those courses and stuff like that. We're actually all far more alike than we initially realized. And I had that kind of revelation into my adulthood. I wish I had it earlier, but that's kind of how things played out. And again, too, this stuff I'm talking about, it all relates to event planning because it's, it's about making sure, in my opinion, obviously you hit your quota and you do what needs to be done on paper, but I'm telling you, man, making sure people enjoy what you're putting together. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So thank you so much. You're giving so much great information and, and tidbits, of, but I have no idea there's a wrestling school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's an actual wrestling school where they go and do they teach you everything about the techniques of wrestling, but also marketing, promotion. They teach all of that? So there are independent wrestling schools all over the world. I couldn't even tell you how many there are here in the United States. Uh, World Wrestling Entertainment has a performance center that's here in Orlando. I think it's the best wrestling school in the world. It's the best place you could possibly go. You learned everything you know, from the ground up, uh, everything you just mentioned. Um, you know, in terms of learning how to break your falls, psychology, as you said, business, marketing, all that stuff. Um, if you have excellent teachers, ego-free, and they want to see you succeed, uh, they will they will teach you that type of stuff. Uh, I went to a school in Las Vegas. It was called uh, FSW, Future Stars of Wrestling. And when I went in there, um, I had, I was very lucky, I had really good mentors. And after a few years when I found success, um, I didn't necessarily want to teach people how to wrestle. I wanted to teach people how they could connect the dots to move up the chain and actually make money. I was really fortunate to find a way how to uh, make a living independently uh, before I got to WWE, how to basically put it all together and build your own brand, again, which could fall directly under event planning as well as, as building a brand within what you're doing. That's awesome. I have a second part to that because it seems like as if any entertainment um, operation, there's always the, the opportunity for to succeed and fail, right? Oh, yeah. There's also when you get a lot of money, there can be drugs and alcohol and parties. And, and so what tips I don't mean to sound like a cliche with what I'm about to say, like a, like an old 80s commercial or early 90s commercial about like don't do drugs. But like, I, yeah, like just gonna tell you, like just being real with you, um, being in the various different lanes of entertainment and nightlife and stuff like that, uh, it ruins people. And this isn't anything that you guys don't know. I don't need to, to lecture you on that, but. If you see it in your business, stay as far away from it as humanly possible. People unravel on that on that shit, and um, you know I've had I've had friends that are no longer here who were totally straight edge and never had any sort of intention of ever developing a problem, and they just messed with something once or twice, thinking, oh, you know, anecdotally I'm totally fine. I guess it wasn't the the devil everybody says it was, and it happens fast, man. I'm sure somebody in here, at least a couple people, know people with problems. Stay as far away from it as possible, especially too if you're um, involved with an arts festival. People like to get loose at those types of events and stuff like that. Just don't don't go anywhere near it. Just you know, find find the fastest exit out of that situation as politely as possible. Yes. Sir. I've never really felt obligated to respond to it. I've never been someone who's been um, set off or angry about people calling sports entertainment or wrestling fake. Um, what we do is very unique, and it's somewhat difficult to describe to someone who doesn't watch it and doesn't understand it. Uh, I've never ever been bothered by anyone calling it anything. Like, always remember, you always have to like value somebody's opinion before it can really bother you, you know? never give really any power to that. Um, no one will ever know how hard <laughs> you're being hit in the ring um, or how hard you're getting slammed on the canvas unless they do it. There's literally no way I can explain it to anyone. And you know, 
because of the perception of wrestling and sports entertainment. They might not even believe you anyways. It's sort of like a hill that there's no point in dying on. So, but it never bothered me. I know some guys are just like foaming at the mouth, like, let me get a hold of this guy. It's like, dude, relax, he's 16 years old. Like, <laughs> it's a child. Yeah, it's just a kid. Yeah. So. Yes, sir. Um, so, when you kind of decided to like, become like, a, like serious about wrestling, did you have like uh, a lot of people supporting you or no. was there like a lot of people that said you couldn't do it and how did you like kind of just work past that? Something I I wasn't going to touch base on because it's a, a long story and I didn't want to eat up the time but I can mention, as, mention it as a footnote. So uh, I'm mixed race. Uh, my dad's side was Puerto Rican Italian, uh, Greek, but very Puerto Rican. Mother's side was like three generations American and I think they're like Eastern European, Scandinavian and whatnot two like, and, 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 and military, uh, two totally different cultures of my family growing up. One was just like, you know, super machismo, we don't cry, we punch through the wall. The other side was like extremely regimented, military style. Um, so like, neither side was really about like bullshit. Everything was practical, like you get a job, you work it, then you get another job and you have two jobs. Now you have more money. You don't deviate from that. What do you mean you don't have two jobs? How are you gonna pay your bills? You know, it was very just like old school, you know? Um, when I told them I wanted to be a wrestler when I was a kid, they're like, oh yeah, good luck. You know, they don't wanna totally kill your dream. We, we, we say we have these big aspirations and these big dreams as kids. Um, they don't wanna to totally crush them. As I got older, they were like, you should probably get a little bit more realistic. You're, as kids, we're looking for reassurance. We're not really positive about anything. I was positive about this wrestling thing, though. Um, and I kind of talked myself out of it, not getting the support that I needed to pursue it. And I totally understood why my parents would not want me to do this, especially like with all the hit pieces on the news and you hear about people passing away. Like, if your parents aren't fans of this thing that you want to do, they're not gonna totally support you, but yeah, jump off the top rope and break your ass, you want, you know? That's, that's a great idea, Kevin. So eventually, like I, you know, middle 20s, I had enough income on my own to kind of pursue it, and it was just something I couldn't, I couldn't get out of my head. Like I tried to do everything else. I did blue collar work, and when I was in Vegas, um, I was a professional sparring partner for certain people uh, in MMA. I was always doing martial arts, uh, Dr. G, Professor G, and I have choked each other many times in jiu-jitsu. We were jiu-jitsu partners. Um, so at the time I was thinking, I could probably take some fights because I figured I could handle some people that, that were you know, fighting on pay-per-views and TVs. I thought to myself, I could probably be really, be really good at this. Um, not encouraging this at all. In my late teens, I fought bare knuckle for a short period of time because that was the only thing I could do in the area. That was also insane, wouldn't do it again. Um, but uh, I, I had a family that was just like, do the sure thing. And wrestling was not the sure thing. But as I said, like, if you have that calling in you to do that thing creatively, I'm just letting you guys know, I'm 38, it never went away. You can try to suppress that as much as you want. You'll put it in the back of your mind you'll be goal oriented and you'll focus on what's gonna produce money and financial security, I'm telling you guys, that thing's not gonna go away. So at some point, you have to approach that and embrace it, you have to try it. And it may take you, it may take a lot of work to get there, you know, it'll be worth it. And you know, it might not be something lucrative, but I wanna encourage you guys, whatever that thing is that you guys have that you haven't done yet, that you really want to do and you keep putting it off, again, not to sound cliche, please do it for yourself. There's like so much stuff every week, every day that you guys do for other people, and that's cool. But at some point, you've got to start doing something for yourself or you'll go crazy. You'll be sad or tired or lethargic or miserable for some unknown reason. You know what the reason is. It's, it's because you're not doing that thing that you need to do for yourself. And that, that was just, I just hit that wall, man. I had
had to do it. I was like, I'm gonna do this without any support. And then when it started to work out, then they showed up. As will happen to all of you when your events take off. Oh, look at that, this is amazing. Can I get some free tickets? So, that's the truth. Yes? Um, embracing my own ideas and seeing them work is what helped me overcome not having, let's say perhaps, the type of support that I needed. I can't say I wasn't totally supportive. I was barely supportive, but uh, something happens when you have an idea creatively and you sit on it for a while then you put it into action and you see it work, I really feel like that changes your personality and your brain pattern and everything. You begin to realize like, oh, I can, I had this idea, it wasn't there, it wasn't even real, I manifested this and I created this. You begin to find that sort of confidence in yourself. You don't, you, you begin to realize like, oh, I don't really need to be as supportive as I, as I thought I needed to be. It could be really difficult to pull that idea off. It may take a lot of time and work. You're gonna get pissed. And on the way there, you're gonna feel like you should quit. That's not gonna work out. But if you can push through and you've set up sort of a strategic course to make it work out, I feel, I feel like that changed everything. Like, really simple prime example. I wanted to um, train my own security teams. I thought that I did my job exceptionally well. I didn't think that my job comprised of breaking up fights and answering medical calls on the radio of people who were stabbed and holding their guts in their stomach until the ambulance got there. I didn't think that was what my job totally was. Um, I began to develop other skills within what they were asking me to do that kind of moved me ahead into the position where I wanted to be. It's something silly and simple, but if we're talking about ground level stuff, I used to carry a lighter with me and when I would work the patio at a bar or a nightclub, if I like to stay attentive and watch what was going on, and I, I didn't you know, get bored, I would watch when people were pulling uh, cigarettes out, and I would light their cigarette for them. And they would be blown away, no one else was doing that. Sometimes I would get a tip for that. People remember little things like that. Um, you begin to kind of, I, I began to kind of manage my own area. Instead of just standing there, and waiting for something to go wrong and then dealing with it, you know, providing the solution or whatever. I just started to take more control over what was going on. Not to like a degree where it was unnecessary or too much, but doing little things like that, just being more involved with what's going on around you and not leaving it up to chance or for other departments and stuff like that to kind of dictate where you're gonna go and how you're gonna develop. Um, just being more involved. Does that answer the question? Good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So I've always been really interested in like the concept of like fulfillment. Yep. Especially in, in the minds of like people who have made it to a point where you know they have a goal and they say they're gonna be out there. So I've been a fan of WWE for well since I was a kid. And I'm really fascinated in how different the industry is now compared to the version of it that so, what kind of wisdom could you speak to when it comes to the idea of reaching whatever mountain tops, whether in this industry or otherwise, and maybe it's feeling different from how you dreamed or assumed it would feel, or at least looking different, or just practically being different than what it was when you first had your eye on it? Um, because fulfillment to me is the ultimate thing we're all looking for anyway. Yes. Yeah, sure. Our work or our goals or anything like that. So, what could you speak to just in that regard, like the, the mountain top maybe feeling different than what you Sure. Um, I kind of had that realization once I reached uh, the top of, you know, nightlife and entertainment. Once I got to the top, I realized that's not really what I thought it was going to be like, and then I, I had to pivot and then kind of decide I'm going to go after this childhood dream type thing. Um, in terms of how wrestling is different, you know, sports entertainment uh, now versus what I saw growing up, 
oddly enough, I've come to find that all entertainment that we're watching, uh, television, movies, maybe even novels that we're reading, oftentimes is a reflection of socially what's going on. A lot of people will drive um, their ideas from things that are going on around them. It's very rare that we get like an H.P. Lovecraft. I don't know if anyone knows who it is. He's an author who writes a lot of science fiction and horror. H.P. Lovecraft was a guy who would create these insane settings and ideas and things out of nowhere. Personally, I thought H.P. Lovecraft was brilliant. But at the core of what he was creating from, it was always light versus dark. But in terms of how this is different for me versus how I grew up, I think what we do now, just my opinion on television, um, is sort of a reflection of the present times. When I was younger, there was a lot of different things going on in the world, economically, nationally, uh, socioeconomically, and I think that was in the programming in subtle ways, you know? Aside from it being good versus evil, which is the general premise for almost every story of conflict, um, I would say that's the biggest difference. Um, that answer your question. I just had a conversation with this uh, about this with another performer, his name is AJ Styles, who, in a strange way, over the short period of time, has kind of become a mentor for me. He's, he's been uh, in the game for, I want to say, just over two decades or coming up on it. So, when it comes to putting together a match on TV, when it comes to putting a story together on TV for people to kind of sink their teeth into, um, as a professional wrestler in sports entertainment, I'm always looking to create the perfect story and the perfect match for the audience. And that is almost actually impossible because of all the variables and the probabilities of things that can go wrong and the things that change. But that is what drives me, knowing that my career will be predicated on attempting to create the perfect story and the perfect match for the audience but maybe just being a single step off, it could have been 99%, it makes me want to get up the next day and try again, and I enjoy the pursuit of trying to create that perfect event. And I think all of us in the entertainment industry, at least on my side of the business, are all like that. Like, someone may watch a story or a match and go, that was incredible, that was perfect, that was my favorite match. Us as performers, we will look at things with a different lens than the audience is seeing, and I'll look at that and I'll go, this is what I see wrong with it and this is how I would have done it differently. But I don't tear myself down about it. I just take notes from those types of things and I use them for the next event. And I'm always chasing that, that perfect thing, you know? That perfect event. Uh, it could be a philosophy you guys could adopt for when you guys start doing this too. Yes, about the future, I guess. It's hard on the body. Um, other guys have pivoted, like Batista, Rock, into movies solely, and some guys have stayed on. Maybe the old guys, Ric Flair, wrestled, you know, long, long time. Do you, I mean, you're still in your prime, but do you see ideas or extensions going into staying in the business or, or pivoting to something different going forward? Spiritually, I'm remaining open to whatever sort of thing presents itself to me in my life. I could definitely see myself long-term, once my time is done as a performer, being a producer or a writer, or you know, being remaining a part of the company, I totally could. Um, I also really like teaching. Um, I could see myself doing something like that in, in that capacity, whether it's within this industry or another. Um, I enjoy connecting with people. Um, as privately introverted as I am, I do enjoy the process of being able to like communicate with people, you know, and, and share that with them. Uh, it's something, you know, the, the body breaking down over time is something we're all aware of. And the only thing I can tell you is like, 
I love this so passionately and intensely and enough that I'm willing to go through that process, like personally, wherever it lands me to perform for people. Like I can't even explain in words the feeling and rush that I get when the music hits and you hit the stage and you look up and you see families in the audience. I used to be, I used to be that kid in the audience with my family watching this and knowing that those kids are gonna remember that. You put a smile on their face, they're gonna remember that forever. You come over, high five the kid, he's gonna remember that until you know he's 30 or 40 years old with his kids. Um, there's just so much to enjoy about the process and I've been really fortunate to be able, again, I was traveling recreationally before this industry, but to be able to go all over the world and do events, like I don't know if you guys ever think about that, like your events don't necessarily have to be local or national. You guys could be putting on events on the other side of the planet. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I came from the rat race. I came from the working class. And I grew up on a dead end street in New York, and I absolutely did not think I was getting off that street. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an overly bad street. It wasn't the nicest street, but it was a very small street. I didn't think I was going to be going anywhere. So seeing these people on the TV, never thought I was going to meet them. Never thought I was going to climb inside the screen and do their shit. I absolutely didn't. I thought maybe. Best case scenario, I'd work with my grandfather, be an electrician or a mechanic or something, you know. Everybody wants to be an actor when they're little or they want to be in an action movie or do something like that. Um, I didn't think that that was gonna happen um, and it almost didn't. And it would have been okay if it didn't happen, but um, what would not have been okay is if I didn't find fulfillment in some sort of work I was doing. And I really wanted to drive that home with you guys today. Like don't, don't let this career path just be a thing that you're doing to get by. Like there is something that compelled you all to be here doing this. And I don't think it was just about the money. I think that you guys like organizing and planning things for people to be structured. Perhaps all of you are very much like me. You wanna arm people with the tools to succeed, even for the corporate events and stuff like that. You want those people when they're coming in to network and figure out how they can improve their situation in a, in a comfortable environment. That's important, you know, with the arts festivals. You guys wanna make sure people have a good time at those and take pictures and then look back at those pictures for three or four decades. Uh, I think it's all relative. So, so what we'll probably do is, uh, over the next few weeks, is the jiu-jitsu thing, where when someone comes and does a seminar or one of our coaches go to a seminar, we, we break that seminar down over the next few weeks. Um, I know we're here to speak about larger than life events. And there's such an important message the entire time that, that Kevin gave up. We never talk about giant budgets or big productions. It's more about the energy that you bring to events and how you make people feel about events, right? And that's what really makes events larger than life. Um, so I hope you all absorbed every single word he said. It was all so, so true. Um, and I just want to see if you have any final words of wisdom or inspiration as they go into this semester to produce an event for the course, but also far beyond uh, in, their, in their journeys. No matter what you're doing, make sure you are happy and you are enjoying it. Yes, life is a grind, and the great things that we want in life are not attainable immediately. You're going to have to suffer. All of us are gonna have to suffer to get to an elevated position in life. It's part of life, there's, there's no way around it. You might not see other people suffer to get to where they want to be. Um, and it may seem like they didn't suffer. It may seem like they just landed there. But uh, I'm just telling you, like, suffering is inevitable. And just be happy with what you're doing so the suffering actually means something. You begin suffering for no reason. You're doing something you don't want to be doing because somebody told you to do it or somebody told you that this was the sure thing. It's no way to live life. I did so many years of my life just because I thought it was the sure thing it was gonna produce a result, and it did, but I wasn't happy with it. Um, the road I'm on right now is far harder than anything I did prior to sports entertainment, but I love this shit. I absolutely love it, and I just want everyone to find that for themselves, and it can be found through this. I'm absolutely certain, but it's just gonna be on you. There's gonna be days where you're gonna to have to fight for the sensible decision that somebody next to you doesn't see as sensible, fight for it. Because it, it matters to you. Protect the things that matter to you. 
And before we give uh, Kevin and the boss one last thing, I want to say to, to close up. As you go through this industry, there's so many people that you're going to meet and encounter and people that you want to impress, right? Because of the status they have or the things they've done or the connections they might uh, give you, right? The opportunities they might be able to give you. But one thing I'll say from all the areas I've been in the industry, the people that you want to keep close to you are the people that genuinely want you to be better and want to help you throughout your journey, right? And this can be as simple as we do jujitsu together and guys at his level could literally just kill me in a second because I'm still the new guy, right? <laughs> but when we trained together, he gave me pointers and generally wanted me to get better, which is why I gravitated towards with Kevin because he wanted me to be better at what I do, even though he knew, and I knew, he could just crush me whenever he wanted, right? Um, so keep people around you that want you to be better. So thank you so much for coming here and wanting everyone here to be better at what they do and for spending your time with us. Does everybody want to come up and we'll do a group picture together on, on stage?